Tonight, the message that I have for this youth service, okay, is um, is the reality of heaven and hell. The reality of heaven and hell. So, this is this is very this, yeah this is super important because I want people to to lit to understand the existence of hell, heaven and hell. Because knowing that it's real affects the way you live your life. It's just true, right? If someone doesn't think it's real, they're not going to live like it is real. Because it absolutely is real. Um, and we'll see it in the, the Holy Scriptures that there's only two places that someone can go to after they die. It's either heaven or hell. So I want to start with Luke chapter 16. Uh, verse starting at verse 19 the it's a the famous story of the rich man and Lazarus and this is Jesus talking Jesus in, in, in this it says there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus Full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being torment, and being in torments in Hades or hell. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So what we can first see here is that the rich man went where? He went to hell, right? So the rich man um, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So Lazarus basically went to paradise, okay? And... Um, the, the situation is this. Some people go to heaven and some people go to hell. And when someone goes to hell, it's, there's torment. There's torment. Because we're going to see what kind of torment uh, the rich man is going through. Verse 24, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So the reason why people are tormented in hell is because they're literally burning in hell. They're burning. There's fire in hell. And so it becomes so unbearable that even if, uh, even if he could have... You know, notice that he's what he's asking for is just one little, just the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. Just a little bit, not even a full glass. So people have to realize that we should be thankful that we're here right now. We have access to a glass of water or a cup of water, right? Someone in hell wishes they could have one drop of water, Okay. So it's a serious thing because this is a, some this is when someone goes to hell there's no way out of it. It's a place where it's tormenting and no matter what they do they can't escape and they they can never have what they're wanting to have. He can't get a, a, uh, the tip of his finger with water uh, or the Lazarus he can't even get a drop of water. So verse 25, but Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as someone going to hell and then being able to get out of it, you know, by crossing over to heaven somehow, you know. So 
what you you have to understand that your life right now is the time that you have to make the decision whether you're going to believe in Jesus or not. So when someone's alive, this is the opportunity you have to decide whether you're going to believe in Jesus and serve Jesus or to reject Jesus. There's no chance after this, okay? Um, and people that have had near-death experiences, which are very rare, but they have occurred, the people, there's many, there's testimonies of people that have seen hell with their own eyes, um, and when, if, when they miraculously survived, they became born-again Christians because they realized the truth. Okay, that's including for people that were non-believers, when they had a near-death experience, they got saved. Because they realized, okay, Jesus is the only way out of that place. There's no other way to prevent you from going to hell other than Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Um, so, let's see here. Verse 27, then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Verse 28, for I have five brothers that, they, he may, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So, so uh, the rich man is trying to ask uh, someone to go and witness to soul win, okay, to go to his brothers to prevent them from coming to hell. Because it's so bad. All right. Now, what does that tell you? I mean, he's, he's basically becoming an evangelist in hell. He wishes that he could win these souls. He wishes that he could reach his brothers. Right? So it, it's better to have that mentality right now while you're alive than, to, than for someone to go to hell and then realize that they should have done something. But that's when... When, when we live as Christians believing in Jesus, we have to realize this reality that this is our opportunity right now. Don't wait till it's too late. Not only do you have to make sure you're saved, right? If, you, if, someone, if, if someone doesn't believe in Jesus, they need to believe in Jesus. But once you believe in Jesus, let's remember how all these other people in the world are are going to be tormented in flames forever and ever unless they hear the gospel and they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So that's why it's good to remember this now and not when it's too late, when someone's in hell, it's already too late. So, you know, when that's why it doesn't make sense for someone to, it doesn't make sense to pray for someone that's already died. But I have had people ask me to do that. Um, because once someone is dead, with one exception, you know, if you want to pray that they're raised from the dead and God, you know, wants to raise them from the dead, okay, then pray for them. But if, if you want to pray for their, um, their eternal destiny, that was already decided before they died. They, they either received the gospel of Jesus Christ and went to heaven, or if they didn't receive the gospel... They're in hell. And they don't if they don't believe in Jesus, they're in hell. So let's see here. Verse 27. Oh, wait, no, I already read that. Verse 29. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But verse 31, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Wow. So there is an interesting attitude about the rich man mm -hmm. who is even in hell, he's rebelling and disagreeing. Mm -hmm. Right. He's so that was a, that's a sign. And I, I learned that from Reinhard Bonnke because he preached it like that. The reason why the rich man is in hell, it's not because. It's not because he's clothed in purple and, you know, he's uh, uh, living in luxury. That's not the reason why he's in hell, you know. So let's make that clear. I'm going to pull up the New Living Translation. Okay, so it's not because he had nice clothes and stuff. It's because he kept saying no. Wow. He kept saying no. Even, even in hell, he's telling Abraham no and disagreeing with him. Mm. He's He's... 
people that say no to Jesus go to hell. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. So it's important to say yes to Jesus and say, yes, Lord, you know, I believe, yeah. you know. And so that's really the main difference between someone that makes it to heaven and makes it to hell. The difference is, did they say yes to Jesus mm -hmm. or did they say no? Yeah. And, um, and so I want to read from Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 6. It says, Isaiah 55, verse 6. It says, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Verse 7. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. So the time that someone is alive on the earth is the chance they have to repent. This is their opportunity right now. When someone's alive, this is their chance to repent before their eternity is determined after they die. Right? And so seek the Lord while you can find him. This is the opportunity that people have where, while they're alive. This is the opportunity they have to actually ask, call on the Lord, and they shall be saved. There's no calling on the Lord when someone's in hell. It's, it's already past that. But if you're alive, you have the opportunity to call on the Lord, and he will, he will save you. And it even says that he will generously forgive you. When someone repents and says, I'm sorry, Lord, for my sins. I believe in the Lord Jesus. God will have mercy and wash your sins away, forgive you. And save you from hell so that you can go to heaven. He will have mercy on you. He will have mercy on someone who repents. Okay? And so this is the opportunity for people to turn around. Right? The, the, the people that get in trouble are the ones that wait to change. That they, they wait to the future to turn around from doing wrong. They keep putting it off to the future. See, when someone doesn't have... Christ, they don't have any guarantee of living a long life. Because living a long life is a blessing we receive by being a believer in Jesus and uh, honoring our father and mother and God, you know, protecting us and blessing us with long lives that go well for us. But without Christ, people don't have a guaranteed long life that they can have faith in. They, their lives could get cut short at any moment. And so let this also be a motivation to you that if there's someone in your life that you know doesn't know Jesus, this is the opportunity they have while they're still alive to receive Christ. And, um, and God wants to use you to do that. Okay. So because the Bible says, how can they call on him whom they've never heard or how can they... In Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 14, what does it say? But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? That's an important scripture because it shows us that you're not just praying for someone to be saved, although you know it's good to pray that, but you also have to be ready to be the one that goes and preaches to them so that they can be saved. Mm -hmm. Praying for them is good because then God can soften their heart mm -hmm. in preparation for you to go preach to them. Wow. And so, praise God, or someone. Yeah. And maybe if it's not you, maybe someone else. But you don't want to depend on someone else because that someone else might not even be there. That someone else may not ever show up if they don't obey, right? Because mm -hmm. there is like... You know, there's like a quote that I heard from a, some servant of God um, that she, this, this person believes that God sends calls on enough people to witness to every person in the world at any given time. That there's a, he calls on enough people to serve him that every person can hear the gospel. And, and reach them. But 
the problem is not because God didn't send someone. The problem is because people don't respond to his call. Wow. So that's why there are people that don't hear it. Wow. It's not because God doesn't want them to hear it. It's because someone that was assigned to that person didn't obey wow. and didn't preach. Wow. Right? And I, I, that's, that sounds like it's true, honestly, the, you know, that concept mm -hmm. is that, yes, God wants everybody saved because in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, verse uh, 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior, verse 4, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Hallelujah. And so you have a great part to do with it. And um, God's going to use you to do that. Praise God. So I want to look at something that's also very important. Luke chapter 10. is Starting at verse, uh, let's see. Starting at verse 1. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. Mm -hmm. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers unto his fields. Verse 3. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. <laughs> so it's interesting in this part that it shows us that uh, Jesus is telling you to pray yep. to send workers into the fields. Mm -hmm. And then after you pray that, he's telling you to go. Wow. Whereas like, you know, some people, you know, it, it, you know, I don't want Christians to become, I don't want people to become people that pray for someone else to go, but then forget that the next verse says you need to go then. You know, it's not just you praying for yeah. someone else to do it. It's you praying for people to go and you are part of that. Yeah. You know, so praise God. Verse 4, don't take any money with you, nor traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. You know, have faith in God. You know, sometimes people are waiting to do something because they are waiting for, uh, you know, someone to give them a, a cash mm. or, or, or a check. Yeah. They're waiting for some, they're waiting to win the lottery, so to speak, before they go do something. Yep. Or they're waiting for their business to grow and become big or something before they can serve God. But serving God starts when he calls you. Mm. That's when it starts. Not when, not when you have enough money saved up. Yeah, that's good. Um, because if you're always waiting for that, then you're not... Um, having faith in God providing for you in the call, mm -hmm. which you can only receive God's provision by obeying the call, not by your own flesh, by leaning on the arm of flesh, so to speak. You know, if you try to lean on your own strength, then it won't work. But if you realize that it's by his spirit, it's not my, not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, by God's spirit, that you will get it done. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, let's keep going. Whenever you enter someone's house, first say, may God's peace be with, on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. Mm. You know, when you're working for God, God is keeping count of what you're doing and he yeah. will get you paid. He will pay you. Um, because there's nothing more valuable to God than someone who's doing his work to win the lost. Because when you think about it, he paid a super, super high price with sending his own son, right, to sacrifice him to then, you could say, purchase the souls of mankind. By his own blood, right? So he, his greatest investment was to save you. That was his greatest investment. He had to he had to pay.
pay that high price so that you could be saved from hell and that therefore have a personal relationship with him restored without sin being in the way separating man from him. Jesus came to take away that sin so that way you could have that personal relationship with him and have be he so that he can finally have you back in his house, back in his family, right? So that you won't be lost for eternity, so that he can have you for eternity, okay? So when you go out and you go winning souls for Jesus, what you're doing, okay, is what God's heart is. God's heart is for the lost to come back to him. So when you're working for God's heart, then you can you can be like David, right? You're after you're a, you're a man or a woman after God's heart. All right? And when you're after God's heart, he will absolutely make sure you're taken care of. He will absolutely make because he doesn't have a ton of people doing that. And so the very few people that he has, all right, are going to be rewarded uh, to also motivate you to continue because he wants you to continue doing yeah. that. Yeah. And so you're going to get paid financially, but also in different parts of your life. And I'm going to show you that in, in this scripture. We'll see this. Uh, there's something that I want you to see what happens. Okay. Um, verse 8. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Verse 9, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Verse, 20, uh, verse 10, but if a town refuses to welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from our feet to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. What fate is it talking about? The fate of hell. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone refuses the gospel, that's, that's their fate, is hell. Verse 12, I assure you, even wicked Sodom will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day. Wow. That's a strong wow. statement because we know what happened to Sodom. Yeah. They were, yeah, this, I mean, there was fire yeah. came down and destroyed them. Yeah. Verse 13, what sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, the, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Verse 14, yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. Mm. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. Okay, so it's all hanging on whether someone repents and receives Jesus or they don't. Then he's, uh, verse 16, then he said to the disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to check something in the other translation here. Yeah, And so, verse 17, I want you to notice this. Then the 70 returned with joy, mm -hmm. saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So, but I want you to notice the part that they returned with joy. When you go soul winning, one of the rewards you're going to have is joy in your life. That's why when they went and did the work in soul winning, they were joyful. And anyone that goes soul winning knows exactly what, yeah. what I'm talking about. When you win someone to Christ, it's joy. Like, it's hard to explain, yeah. but it's there's no other joy like bringing the lost. It's a special type of joy. It's a spiritual joy. It's a joy of fulfillment, right? It's a joy of satisfaction of your one of the purposes of your life being fulfilled, okay? Because how do I know it's one of the purposes of our lives? It's the Great Commission. Jesus made it a command. It's the great command. It's the great work. It's the great thing we're supposed to do. And when we do it, no wonder we're so happy. It's because Jesus is happy. It's God's happy. The angels are rejoicing with, with souls. And so I think 
that one of the greatest remedies for any Christians that are depressed and sad is they need to go soul winning. They have to start doing what God commanded. It's, it's not a surprise if you have a Christian who doesn't go soul winning and they're not happy. And they're just not fulfilled in their life. Because that's, you, you know, that's part of the call of being saved is that we need to do this work. And this is the great work. This is what makes church exciting. This is what makes um, coming to church exciting, especially if you see people that are new, yeah. that come in, they, the lives are transformed, they bring more people. You know, they, they, you know this, is, this is what makes church joyful. It's not joyful if you're coming in, not doing anything for God, and you just want to sit and sit and listen and sit and then go home and do nothing. There has to be something that you could do for God, and the good news is there is. Yeah. Learning how to reach the lost and doing it. Praise God. Praise God. And so I did want to mention a very important verse in the Bible, okay, is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. It says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. But the Apostle Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That means you know that if someone doesn't receive Jesus, they're going to burn in hell for eternity. And knowing that is an important part of your important part of the motivation of why we are working to persuade people to receive Jesus because it's like it's like you see someone on the train tracks and there's a train coming and you're trying to convince them why they have to get off the train track because we know they're about to get hit okay and it's over for them unless they come right unless they get out and receive Jesus and so it's the same thing right with with with, with, with um Get, winning the lost, you're, you know, there's a, there's different motivations, right? The love being the greatest motivation, but I also want you to see that you, it's important for you to know that hell exists. It's a real place that is eternal torment, and it's going to help you to have like a urgency that these people need to get saved. That they need to, get, they need, you, we need to persuade them so they don't fall into. A lake of fire. All right, and and there are uh, testimonies. There's a there's a book called by Bishop Dag Hayward Mills called "Those Who Went to Hell," and that's a great book. Those who went to hell because it'll show you there's different testimonies of people that have um, that have witnessed hell with their own eyes when they died, and then they came back. They miraculously survived to tell the story. And there are times when people have had siblings that have died in the past. And then this guy went to hell. When he died, he started to see, um, as I think he was dying in an ambulance. And then and the smoke started filling up the, and then he started, and then he saw like what was like a, a lake um, or like a quarry or something like a, yeah, a lake where, but it was just fire. And he said it, it reminded him of when he was playing as a kid and they put gasoline on the water and lit it up. He said it looked just like that. Oh and he, he, he saw two, um, he saw two people like in the distance and he just wanted to go see like who they were, who yeah. are they? And it was, and then he realized as he got closer, it was his two brothers that had died in a car crash from years before. And he was like, and then he was like, what are you doing here? It's like, you know, you die in a car crash and um, whatever. And uh, and they said, and I'm just, this is off memory, so it might not be exactly what I'm saying, but but they were they're basically telling him, you, you know, you can't come here. Yeah. Like, you cannot come here. You, there's no way out of here. And um, those are the types of experiences that people, when the people come back from that experience, they know it's real. Yeah. And, uh, and they get saved. Because they're like, wow, you know, they saw their own siblings in hell. Um, and he saw other people too. I think he saw, 
other people that, that he, you know, but but it's, it's that those types of things. There's also experiences that people had where they've, as they're dying, if they don't believe in Jesus, demons are start taking their soul out of their physical body and dragging them down to hell. Jesus. And then, you know, so, you know, they've had instances where they're like calling out to Jesus and then they get saved oh. miraculously. But like, that's the type of experiences that people have. You know, when they don't know Jesus, the demons literally take their soul down to hell. Mm. So when you know about these things, it really puts it into perspective. You know, like, wow, you know, how real this is, yeah. you know, and how... Um, you know how important it is for people to know Jesus Christ and the reason for this is because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God mm -hmm. right Romans 3:23 and so the wages of sin is death and but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ and since everybody has sinned that means that everybody has a debt to pay with God because God is righteous, and sin has to be paid for, and the, and the consequence and the price of sin is death and hell, basically. And so the only way that you can escape the consequence of your sins is Jesus Christ, because he was born without sin to then be our sacrifice that takes our sins, okay, um, to, to, and he suffered a horrible death for us when he went to the cross, which is the type of death that we deserved. Mm -hmm. And it even says that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He even went to hell, um, paid the, the full price of our salvation from sin. And so, and then he rose from the dead to prove that it was paid for, that it was done. That it was paid, hallelujah, and we're justified through his sacrifice. And then, uh, and so there's no other sacrifice that's able to, to pay our, that price of sin. Um, there's no one else. Why? Because only Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God that was born from a virgin who, he, you know, he was born without... Uh, a, a human man involved and the Holy Spirit, God put that baby in Mary so that she could give birth to our, to the Savior, to our Lord and Savior. And no one, there's no other religion that has any way of paying the price for our sins and therefore there's only one Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to go to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, for the Son of Man has come. <laughs> yeah, this is the verse I was trying to get to. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Wow. Wow. So that's why Jesus came was to do this, to win souls. Yeah. So let's keep the main thing the main thing, right? I mean, let's focus on what is the main thing with Jesus. The main thing is to seek and save that which was lost. That's why he wow. came. You know, um, the problem that happens, you know, with some Christians, okay, is that we get so, uh, we can, we can, you know, if we get too comfortable with the fact that we're saved and we get too comfortable with our lives in the sense that, okay, we're already saved, so it's great and everything, yeah. we don't want to get sidetracked with trying to get, you know, think about so many other things and trying to learn so many things to the point where we forget what the main thing is. Does that make sense? We're trying to get, you know, because it's important to get wisdom. It's important to get knowledge because there's a lot to life. There's a lot of things that God wants you to do and wants you to know. 
But we can't let knowledge puff us up to the point where we forget the main reason why Jesus came was to win the lost. You know, there's no point to having so much revelation and knowledge if it's not producing fruit and winning souls. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you just have this huge brain, but you're just sitting there doing nothing with it. So what's the point of all the knowledge, right? Yeah. So it's good to have knowledge. It's good to continue to get wisdom, but learn how to apply it to where it actually produces tangible results. That's what we want to do. We want to apply all the knowledge and wisdom we have towards the main thing, which is to win the lost. That's what all your knowledge is for. That's what all your wisdom is ultimately designed for, right? I'll give you an example. Let's say someone is skilled and called for uh, graphic stuff or media, or right? someone's like super skilled at um, videography or making videos, so they're super good at this stuff, right? Okay. If, you know, when they're in the kingdom of God, and let's say they're a Christian, how does that, how is, how should that talent be applied? It should be applied in a way that promotes the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be promoting, um, helping, uh, for example, promoting a, uh, a church and the preaching of the word by promoting that on social media, for example, or through movie or whatever, and getting, and basically with the ultimate goal of what? Attracting the lost to get saved. So any skill you have, it's designed to get people saved. That's what, that's what your skill and your gifting is for. Uh, and you can apply that in so many different ways, right? Any skill, any skill. Preaching is obvious because preaching, you know, you, you get people get saved when they hear preaching. But if you're not preaching, if there's, if you have a skill that's other than that, me, okay, music, music. People are good at music. Some people are called into the worship, you know, into worship uh, and, and playing music. What is that ultimately for? To... Uh, usher in or, or to invite the presence of God into the church when you're worshiping to prepare someone to be saved. Wow. To prepare someone to be saved. So once again, the skill is for what? To save the lost. It's meant to be applied to save the lost. It's not meant for, you know, it's actually not meant for just you to make money. For example, you know, that's when people get twisted in their in their motives and their intentions is, is if their whole end goal is to make a lot of money. The money will come if your motive is is to, to do God's work, to save the lost, to care for people. Then the money is actually a side thing that helps you to do what? Win the lost. That's what the, that's what the money is for. It's not for you to pile up. It's, the money is for you to be blessed, be taken care of, and have money to win the lost. You know, that, that's, that's what, I mean, anything in the kingdom of God, um, you know, you can use money to, to be a part of that. You know, cru for example, like um, crusades, if someone sets up an outreach to reach thousands or millions or whatever, you know, you reach thousands of people. It takes money to do that. So God gives people money to be able to facilitate the building of things, like this building here and the church building, you know, costs a lot of you know, costs a lot of money. So there has to be money there, and then you can see how this money is being used to reach people, right? This is so that's the correct application of things is Use your money to, to win the loss. Use your money to grow, do something for God, for his heart, which is to win the loss. That's what he's trying to do. That's what he's wanting to do. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. And I want to, I think this may be the last thing I want to talk about tonight. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, 
and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Mm -hmm. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. I actually like the King James. King James here. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So when people are not, you know, when you're in the, how do you get in the book of life? You believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you believe it in your heart. You confess it out of your mouth. You, you believe he's raised from the dead. He's your Lord and Savior. You live according to His ways, and you follow Him. And so, you're, it's essentially, your faith in Christ, your faith in Jesus, that's ultimately what gets your name in the book of life. Now, when someone's not in the book of life, okay, they're judged based on their works to be able to receive salvation, and they can't because they have all sinned. So they get judged on their sins, and that's what sends them to hell. Because there's no blood to cover those sins. There's no blood to wash it away if they don't believe in Jesus. So that's how somebody, that's why you can't earn your way to heaven. And that's why somebody that doesn't have Jesus is judged and they're sent to the lake of, into the lake of fire. Okay, where there's going to be... Uh, Tormenting day and night forever and ever, just like it was for the rich man mm -hmm. in the story of rich man and Lazarus. All right, hallelujah, mm -hmm. hallelujah. And heaven is going to be a, is a wonderful place, you know, because once there, once you're in heaven, and then eventually, right? There's well, let's see, and, and when there's a new heaven and new earth in Revelation twenty one. Verse 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Hallelujah. And so, we want to see our family members in heaven, we want to see our friends in heaven, and we want to see people, even people we don't know, to be in heaven with us. And we, we want to reach them. We, we don't want them to be tormented in hell forever and ever. We don't want anyone to go there. Okay? We want everybody to be saved. And that's our goal. So that's the message tonight is there is a heaven. There is a hell. There is an important understanding and revelation that we must have that they exist. And that you have a very important role in getting this done to get the lost from, they save the lost from hell by giving to them uh, the message about Jesus, okay? And the simple way you can reach someone about Jesus Christ, okay, is, is to learn how to preach the gospel. To learn how to preach the gospel. And I'm just going to have a quick breakdown for you, all right? And you can learn this on Tuesday night. At 6 p.m., when we we have prayer and then soul winning, and we can, we use soul winning scripts, mm -hmm. but essentially to get someone saved, that you first have to get them to realize that they have sinned against God. And the easiest way is Romans 3:23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So in order for someone to be saved, they first have to realize they're lost. So that way they understand, okay, they've sinned. And, what's, and because of their sin, the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. So in order to get someone saved in preaching the gospel properly, is to make them realize that they have sinned, and because of that sin, they have a horrible destiny in hell unless there's somebody, a savior, which is the gift of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of, 
uh, Jesus Christ saving them from their sins that they've committed, the price of their sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when, when you simply share that message, that's how people get saved. There's a power in preaching that message where God will be with you to yeah. confirm that. Because it's not just it's not just on your shoulders when you're preaching that. It's not just you having the the skill, okay, of co totally convincing someone's mind. It's not it's not just you when you're preaching the gospel. God's gonna be there to convict their heart and yeah. turn them to Christ. So it's different than trying to convince them of um, some some non you know Christian thing. If you're trying to convince them about politics or something like that, you know. There, it's going to be harder to try to convince people of certain things. But when it comes to the gospel, there's a supernatural power in it that when you're preaching it, God's going to move with you. So it's not just you trying to convince someone. It's you persuading someone by the power of the Holy Spirit working with you to confirm with signs and wonders. And bam, that's why people get saved. Hallelujah. And you, when they know they're lost, they, have, they, know, they know they need a Savior. Then you tell them Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, and then you pray for them. Yeah. And then you ask them to say the prayer with you. And you'll be surprised at how easy it is for a lot of people mm -hmm. to simply receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And it will, you'll have so much joy in your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name. So I want to pray right now for uh, anybody... Uh, for, for Tony who's listening, but also the, all the people that are going to watch this afterwards, all right, in the replay, I pray for you in the name of Jesus. I ask the Lord to bless you and touch you, okay? And, and first, I want to give the invitation that anybody who's never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior or once did, but have fell away in sin, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to give your life. Wherever you're listening, God will hear you. So if you want to make sure you're right with God, that your sins are paid for, that you're forgiven, and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior once and for all, I want you to say this prayer with me. All right? And God will save you from hell. And, and you will know that you're going to heaven because of your faith in Jesus. So say this, Dear Lord Jesus... Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I turn away from sin. I repent. I'm sorry, Lord, that I've sinned. Heavenly Father, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord, that you died for me. You paid for my sins. I receive your forgiveness now. Write my name in the book of life. Thank you, Lord. Wash me and cleanse me by the blood of Jesus. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm saved, and I'm forgiven. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, give me a hunger to preach the gospel to the lost so that they can also be saved. In Jesus' name. And if you pray that prayer, you are saved, you're forgiven of your sins. You know you're right with God because of your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not because of anything you've done right or wrong. It's because simply because you believe in Jesus, that's why you know you're going to heaven. And so now it's time to get to work, saving the lost, bringing the lost in, and being partaking in the joyful work of serving the Lord because he's been good to you, to forgive you. Yeah. So let's get the message of, of God's love through our Lord Jesus Christ to people that need it now. So praise God. And you can, if you're online and you, you got saved, I want you to go to our website at church at northwood.com and uh, click on I Just Got Saved. There's a free course for new believers. All right. And uh, our church meets on Sundays at 1030 a.m. At 2672 James B. White Highway North, Whiteville, North Carolina, 28472.
Did I say that right? The address right? 2672 James B. White Highway North. Yep, that's it. Whiteville, North Carolina, 28472. Have it a good night. God bless y'all.